So we're going to move on to archetypes now, which I think is an important aspect of meaning, really. Um, particularly meaning as it relates to, well, stories. Stories in general and stories we tell ourselves. Um, so I could type uh, the whole theory of archetypes and the practice of working with archetypes, I think, comes overwhelmingly from Jung and from Jungian psychology. Um, I'm going to give, up, I suppose, is a kind of simplified and practical form to it, which I've arrived at for a period of you know, working with it. But, um, you know, I'm not going to go into how this may or may not cohere with Jung, but, you know, I can always discuss that if you're interested. Um, so, basically, I see see archetypes as, as um, well, they're types of, of symbol. Uh, so, so they're... Obviously, types is important here. They're not specific symbols, but they're types of symbols. They're, they're um, sort of groupings of symbols, if you like, uh, which mean for us psychological functions. So, so there's, there's two crucial elements there in, in how we understand what an archetype is. Um, so there's, there's um, a psychological function, and I'll say that in a minute about what I mean by that. So something going on in our, our minds at the moment. And um, there's a, a meaningful symbol. So we talked in the first half about what a meaningful symbol might be. Yes, a meaningful symbol obviously relates to our experience. It's created neural connections and leads us to respond in, in particular ways to, to, to symbols that we encounter. Um, and, and obviously, uh, it, each archetype covers a family or a set or type of, uh, of meaningful symbols rather than just a specific one. Um, so the exact symbols particularly may vary between cultures and, and situations. It's, you know, what, what symbol uh, fulfills that function? Um, so archetypal symbols can embodiedly represent or carry the emotions of different functions that we might have. Um, and just to, just to start you off to, to try and relate this to a uh, specific experience to start you off, the kind of symbols we're talking about particularly are things like um, saints, God, the devil, the hero in your story, um, but also the hero you might be in your own story, or the devil you might be in your own story, or whatever, yeah? Um, there's a, this is a kind of terrain we're, we're on here, the realm of story. Um, so a bit more about psychological functions, and, and, and so this is really drawing on, but maybe perhaps a slightly slim, simplifying young. Um, I'd say there are four main uh, functions that contribute to archetypal symbols. I'm not saying this is necessarily a complete list, but it seems to be, to me, a list of the ones that are important. So there's um, the ego which consists of our, of our goals and identifications. So we can have symbols which for us mean what we want, what we aspire to, uh, what we think we can achieve, um, and whatever surrounds that. Um, there was the, it's the function of integration, and particularly uh, integration as a goal that... Uh, we could reach in the future. Um, so that's particularly associated with what Jung calls the God archetype, um, or some kind of wiser, bigger being than ourselves um, archetype. Um, so that connects to uh, our experience of being able to work towards something bigger, more integrated than where we are now. Um, and the experience of, of Having a left hemisphere which identifies with particular ideas or representations at particular moments, that the function of integration is about seeing beyond that, recognizing that at other times we have other states and that we have a right hemisphere linking it all together, that could link it all together. Yeah? So the, it, it's recognizing the potentiality and symbolizing that potentiality for integration. Um, then there's the appropriation of the attractive other. 
So there are things or, or people or whatever that we um, don't identify with directly. Uh, we don't think of as us or as, as our terrain. We, we identify directly in that way as part of the ego. But nevertheless, we want them. We want will be to incorporate them into the ego. So, so it's kind of taking um, an aspect of what we could integrate into ourselves uh, and trying to make it part of ourselves. Um, so that's what Jung uh, calls the anima or animus. So in Jung's terminology, the uh, the anima is kind of the, the attractive feminine for a man and the animus is the attractive masculine for a woman. I don't think this necessarily has to take a sexual type of form, but it often does in practice. Um, so obviously the attractive other that we want to appropriate that's a bit different from us, uh, but that we really want to incorporate into us can often have a sexual kind of uh, experience about it. Um, and then there's the rejection. The fourth thing, the rejection of the other, reflecting our fear fundamentally. Um, so... Whatever it is, we're afraid of about uh, other aspects of, of what we could be or what we could be, uh, have as our goals or, or beliefs or ideas that, that are, we see as separate from us and we don't want to be part of us. Um, and that's the shadow. Um, and the shadow is the devil, um, Sauron, Darth Vader. Uh, the evil, um, whoever you think is, is evil or despicable or, um, whatever. So, we could put this, because I don't know if it would help to put this in the form of a diagram. I'll try, um, a simple diagram. But, um, you can think of the ego, which I'll say more about tomorrow, but the ego thought of really as, as our, as our left brain identifications. What we identify with at the moment and think of as us or, or, us or ours at the moment. Um, and then there's the, beyond that somewhere, we've got some sort of idea of um, the projected integrated psyche. Like all the rest of us that isn't the ego and how it might become part of it. Um, so that's what you might call God or the God archetype. Or uh, other terms that Jung used were the wise old man archetype or the wise old woman archetype. Um, so it might not necessarily take you in the form of a, an apparently infinite being. It might be a, a bit more ordinary. And then if you think about how these two things relate to each other, the what is us now and what isn't, um, the, the shadow is that bit of what's not part of us now that we don't want, that we're pushing away, and the animal animus is that part of what isn't part of us now that we're drawing towards us or trying to appropriate. So whether or not you've got issues with those terms, you know, particularly God or the anima might possibly raise issues for people in those ways, but... Um, just try and think in terms of the functions, I would suggest that, that uh, however you understand the terminology and how it ought to work, we have those functions uh, in our lives. Those are the things we experience. We, we have aspirations. There are things we uh, are afraid of and try to push away and there are things that we try and appropriate. And then there's, there's the, you know, the, the, um, the ego archetype. Um, is often associated with the the hero, or um, and I think the, the word heroine has rather fallen out of use, hasn't it, for, for female hero? So maybe you can talk about a female hero and a male hero. Um, the hero, whoever it is, um, is is um, a, a sort of self we identify with that can achieve things in the terms that we think of them at the moment. So, so you know, we can fulfill the quest. We can, you know, uh, cast the, the ring in Mount Doom or we can, um, build that new company or we can write that book or whatever it is that our goal is. Um, you know, if, we, well, if our story contains a, 
a hero, perhaps we're the hero, we're going to achieve that, and our story is our, our achievement. Um, so the hero is basically the, the ego function as we represent it to ourselves. Um, whereas the other functions are more challenging in other ways because they involve things that we are not part of that picture that we have at the moment in some way. Okay, so um, now there's the, way, there's the way we can work with archetypes and why they're important in practice. Um, one of the things that, that psychoanalysis has, has uh, made reasonably clear, I think, is, is that um, archetypes can be absolutized and that this is what can be most problematic for us. So the, the absolutization of archetypes, when we think of the, the archetype not as something that's meaningful for us in our bodies, embodiedly, but when we start to think of the archetype as a thing out there, it exists. Or, alternatively, it doesn't exist. Uh, you know, if we, when we start putting it in that left brain uh, kind of categorization. Um, so when the archetype becomes a thing out there, whether it's God out there, the devil out there, uh, that wonderful woman who's going to solve all my problems if I marry her out there, uh, or that wonderful man, alternatively, if you're a woman, perhaps, or, uh, you know, whatever your, your attractions are. Um, the shadow who's, who's a threat to, to everything that uh, I find valuable and so on. Yeah. Um, so if we think that these are, if we have beliefs about these things, uh, as part of the world around us in some way, um, we're starting to absolutize those archetypes and turn them into things. Um, that's, that's the root of, uh, the difficulties that we have with archetypes. Um, so those beliefs could be about, um, supernatural, what we think of as supernatural things, or they could be natural things. We could think of them as part of a, um, a scientifically accountable natural world, or we could think of them as, as weird beliefs. What, however we think of them, it's, it's the turning them into beliefs rather than appreciating them as meanings. That's the, the issue with archetypes. Um, and even if we just think of them as a thing in here, but not out there, that can also be a bit of a trap. Um, so if we just dismiss the archetypes as not important in some way, as dismissible because they're in our minds, well, our minds are the whole interface with, with everything we experience. So our minds are very important. Um, they're not insignificant because they're only in our minds, whatever that only means. Um, so the absolutization of archetypes is, um, well, what, what, um, Jung talked about unresolved archetypes. So, so, um, or possibly another way of putting this is projected archetypes. Where, where, in your projection, if you think, if you think about a, uh, a screen in a, in a cinema, um, you've got a blank screen to start with. So whatever it is that's out there is like your blank screen and you project onto it that story, that, that psychological function, which is expressed through the archetype. So supposing your, um, your boss is being a bit awkward and you have a bit of a conflict with, with, let's say, him. Um, you think uh, he's a bit authoritarian. You could start projecting the shadow onto your boss and you're, so your boss becomes this, this evil figure. You're basically, you're creating hatred and inciting hatred for the, the boss. And that, that doesn't mean that there might not be real issues that you need to resolve with your boss. Um, and your boss might, morally speaking, be acting in a questionable way. Who knows? But the situation will be complicated. Whatever you can guarantee, it will be complicated. And the the projection is an oversimplification of that complex situation. So, so the fact that we're projecting onto it prevents us from really getting to grips with the real complexity of what's going on. Um, so, so particularly projecting the shadow is a is a very common one. Um, you know, we react to, say, political figures as the other side, they're evil, um, or we react to um, exes or um, whatever they are, you know, or bosses or whatever as, as evil. Um, and then, of course, we can do the same thing with 
particularly with the animal animus. We can fall in love. We can have all sorts of illusions about another person, um, largely because they fulfill a certain psychological function for us rather than because of the qualities they actually have as a person. Um, we can project the god archetype or the wise old man or wise old woman archetype on somebody. So that's kind of the guru complex that, that uh, we think somebody has all the, all the virtues. It's, it's perfect in some way. Actually, they're going to be messy and complicated and lopsided. And they may have some genuine qualities and they may have some, uh, they're very likely to have some faults as well, um, mixed in with that. And of course, projection of the, the ego or the hero archetype, you know, is the belief that, you know, often I'm going to achieve that, that sort of fixed American dream type of projection. You know, I'm going to build that company, whatever may, may happen. Um, and, um, yeah, that can lead perhaps to neglect of other important parts of one's life, for example, uh, to a very unbalanced perspective. Um, or, you know, you might identify with somebody else who does that, uh, who behaves in a heroic way, who imposes their ideology perhaps on the world around them, uh, in a way which is damaging in the end because of the things it doesn't take into account, the conditions it doesn't address. Um, so, um, you, you, you might basically ask, um, why we do this and, uh, you know, why we project and absolutize archetypes. And I think the answer to that links in with all the things I've been saying so far. So the tendency we have to absolutize through the left brain and representations of the left brain, uh, to create metaphysical beliefs, which give us a reassuring certainty about about the world and the way it is. Um, so, um, and this also relates closely to the whole debate about embodied meaning, I think, because if, um, when you project or absolutize an archetype, you're basically saying, well, this is the truth of the matter and this, this meaning for me, uh, say this evil boss is, uh, a true picture in my mind of the state of affairs out there. And we assume that's the case. That's the sort of representational view of the world. Um, but again, if we recognize that the meanings we hold, including the archetypal ones are embodied, you know, they're not just a result of a sort of copy in our minds of what's out there. They're also a result of our emotional states and our, our entire bodily uh, way of resolving or reacting to what's around us. Um, there are, there are various, um, positive ways also then, though we can talk about archetypes. So, so obviously there's the, the danger involved in absolutizing and projecting archetypes, but archetypes are also, I think, wonderful things in some ways. So, um, archetypes have, uh, meaning for us. And if we can separate that meaning from our projected beliefs about archetypal things or people or whatever, um, we can appreciate those meanings in themselves. So I think that working with archetypes has these two sides. There's the avoiding projecting them and there's the positively appreciating the archetypes, which also makes it possible to recognize that uh, our projections are not the archetype or they can be separated from the archetype. Mm. Um, so that's where I think... Um, the value of the arts is becomes really important that, that the arts often uh, represent archetypes for us. They allow us to appreciate that meaningfulness of the archetype in a provisional sort of space. So, you know, you see, you see a, a picture of, um, you know, what for you may be the anima. It may be uh, for a man, it might be a beautiful nude woman or something like this that really represents the anima for him. Uh, or it might be, uh, uh, um, an elevating picture, which for you represents the God archetype in some way. Um, and if you can look at that and not, uh, turn it into a belief or indeed in some way start lusting after it or trying to make it real in some way, but, but you recognize this is meaningful for me and you appreciate it on that level. I think that's a very helpful practice in the sense that, that, um, and that's also at the same time 
developing this provisional state, this provisional space in which we can understand things and work with them um, without kind of blundering into the mistakes we can make when we start having beliefs and, and, and acting on them in a, in a wider world. Um, so the... You know, working with, with archetypes, well, uh, we, we can appreciate experiences that we have, archetypal experience. So um, archetypal experiences may take the form of um, religious experience, is one important one, or what's often called religious experience. I mean, religious experience is a a label for quite a few different things, really. The, the, the people who have uh, visions, which, you know, um, where does a hallucination end and a vision begin? That's you know, a tricky one. Um, or people can have profound experiences in meditation, which you might regard as religious experiences. So, so jhana experiences of, of um, acute integration, which, you know, kind of ecstatic states that one can enter either through meditation or spontaneously without meditation, uh, you could also be in that sort of state. Um, so these are the states which are often described as mystical experiences, that, that um, certain uh, mystics in, in different religious traditions, you know, particularly Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, Islamic, have experienced and recorded through the ages. So religious experiences of that kind um, often involve some kind of archetypal meaning, whether that's, um, you know, say, take a vision of the Virgin Mary by a Catholic, you know, that's, that's an animal experience, you could say, so you could appreciate it on that level as an animal experience before you start building on it, well, that's got a theological baggage around it, around belief in the Virgin Mary and God and so on. Um, so if we can separate that off, um, that can also be meaningful to us if somebody else talks about their vision of the Virgin Mary, for example. Um and then um, there is artistic experience, um, which similarly, you know, again, where does artistic experience begin and religious experience end? But um, particularly if you read, uh, you know, the lives of uh, great artists and composers and so on, you know, they, they often have sublime experiences, um, which... You know, there's, no, there's no clear boundary really between those and religious, what we often call religious experiences. Um, so, um, see, so sometimes such experiences can take a very sort of pure mystical form where they're just about being in an elevated or integrated mental state. But other times they'll be connected to some kind of symbol, to some kind of form or um, uh, person represented in our minds. Um, who is very likely to have an archetypal function or significance for us. Um, so, obviously, you know, you don't have to strain after our archetypal experience, but it's good, you know, if you have an archetypal experience to, to appreciate it as such and to appreciate other people's archetypal experiences. And, um, I find it very, uh, helpful to, you know, to appreciate those archetypal experiences as they're represented in the arts. And, um, so that's something I'll go into a bit more this evening because I'm going to um, show you some Renaissance paintings using a data projector and um, I'll tell you a bit about uh, well my experience of them and how I could understand them archetypally but I'll also invite you to, to respond to them in whatever way you, you, know, you find coming up. Um, so that will, that will give a bit more um, you know, exemplification to this kind of argument. Um, so, perhaps just to summarise then, that, that um, the practice of working with archetypes um, involves these two sides. So there's the, so what might the negative or critical side, which is the critical investigation of our projections. <coughs> so it's, um, it involves recognising that when we have... Um, a strong, perhaps a strong emotional response to a person, uh, particularly a person, sometimes an object, that then that's um, often involves some kind of archetypal projection, which is helpful to try and disentangle from the complexity of the person who's who's behind it or being projected onto. Um, now, obviously, traditionally, 
that disentangling and that critical process has been um, the, the job of psychoanalysis, as, as um, particularly in the Jungian tradition. Um, and obviously, if it's a particularly acute issue, then that might be an appropriate way to do it. But, but uh, my own sense of this is that it's better to try and engage with it ourselves in our own experience. Um, and that uh, unless there's a particular acute problem, then um, you know, if, we, if we do it ourselves or we engage with the critical investigation of our own experiences, our own archetypal experiences, then we take responsibility for it. In a way that, you know, with, with psychoanalysis, there's this constant issue of projection onto the therapist and, you know, the therapist may become a new archetypal projection, which you then have to deal with in turn. Um, you're, you know, you're giving authority to somebody else with these things. So not saying that's not necessary in some cases, but that, that, um, it need, we needn't hold back and say, you know, you need psychoanalysis to deal with all this stuff. It's, that's, that's not the case. There's a, there's a gradual, way in which we can engage with these things as for ourselves. Um, and then, um, so there's a critical investigation of our projections, and then there's also the active and positive appreciation of archetypes. Um, so, so that active and positive appreciation um, involves understanding and responding to them as meanings, which obviously builds on the recognition that meanings are prior to beliefs, um, and that we can um, engage with them in a in a distinct kind of way. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. So any any thoughts or questions on that stuff? Uh, are we are we all just an archetype in some way? So are people are projecting onto me all the time. Like I'm projecting onto everyone else, and we're all just that. And actually, if somebody projects something onto me, and it makes them think that I'm amazing. Then surely that's like well I don't know you get, maybe maybe it's not but I, that is something that I might encourage in order to like uh, in order that they keep thinking that of me. Uh, that's tempting, I agree, but but it's really a temptation to be resisted. I think yeah. and, you know, if you think about the the ongoing consequences of that, supposing supposing somebody has a strong romantic projection onto you and thinks you're wonderful, in fact falls in love with you, what could be, what could be the further effects of that in the longer term? Well, I might let them down, or um, but I think that could lead to marriage and wonderful life and kids and or stock. Is that before or after you let them down? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you could obviously marriage is a whole other discussion, isn't it? But but um, so say in my experience, marriage needs to be founded on um, a, a genuine appreciation as far as possible. Of that person in the in the in the round, you know what their their faults as well as their their virtues, um, and in that way you can appreciate their virtues and allow for their faults and work with their their faults, um, and in that way I think that marriage has a much more realistic chance of of lasting because you're not going to be unpleasantly surprised by faults that then emerge and that you then react to and then you have a conflict and and so on. Um, and the same, the same could apply to any relationship. You know, if um, somebody thinks you're a guru, well, they're going to be disillusioned after a while. Mm. If you know, if you mm. don't make your faults evident to that person, or uh, if you try and conceal it too much, or don't be too straightforward with them. So, where does the middle way philosophy fit in with the whole concept of falling in love and sort of the general? I guess. Um, there's a lot in this culture that sort of idealises that sort of romantic mm. kind of notion of falling in love, but it is quite an extreme state and quite a deluded state, really, isn't it? So how, mm. how do you see that in terms of the middle way? Well, I'd, I'd suggest that, um, as I've just been saying about the archetype, really, that, that you can, you can recognise um, the positive aspects of that, that there is a positive appreciation of that person involved, and indeed, of course, there's a physical response to them involved. Um, but there's also, um, there are also delusions that we, we need to become aware of and, and work with. So, so, um, if the relationship can, uh, factor in or integrate recognition of those limitations in that person as well as appreciation of their qualities, then it's going to be a much more profound and worthwhile relationship in, in my mm -hmm. view. 
um, in the longer term. So obviously, um, perhaps uh, it, it's possible to be extreme about this. Yeah, but some some of my experience in Tri Ratna was of a sort of a sort of anti romantic love ethos in there for, for a while. But but um, sometimes people went to the extreme of you know rather violently puncturing people's uh, romantic love illusions, which probably isn't the kind of thing to do. You know, you've got to find ways of letting people down gently if you've got a friend who's deeply in love or whatever that, that um, help them keep the positive aspects of that at the same time as, as um, gently letting them into the, <laughs> the realities as far as you understand them. The word that keeps coming up this week is balance, really, isn't it? It's mm. fine. And, um, the middle way is, is all about that, I suppose. I've heard people talk about shadow work. Is that in this context, or what's shadow work, or is that completely? It sounds as though it might be. I haven't come across the term, right. but working with the shadow is yeah. it, as an appetite. I didn't know what, yeah. what context. Was. Yeah, and perhaps perhaps that involves uh, well, obviously recognizing the shadow. So sometimes people can be shallowly optimistic in ways that you know needs a bit of grit, needs a bit of grit, almost needs needs the recognition of the shadow. Uh, to become more real, as it were. Um, so um, maybe that's what's what's meant by that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things Ian McGilchrist said about the left hemisphere is that although you know, the right hemisphere is primarily responsible for most emotion, the left hemisphere has two particular emotions. One is anger, which is a kind of shallow and immediate negative response to frustration. Um, but the other is superficial optimism. So, so the left hemisphere often has this construction of what's going to happen, which it sort of blithely believes in and will, will carry on with. Um, so in a sense, shadow work might involve, um, just bringing in more right hemisphere awareness, you know, the, 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 of more of the complexity of the, the conditions that the left hemisphere is sort of blithely representing to itself as the, as the case. So it has a kind of loose optimistic view. But as soon as that cat's challenged, it would get angry. Possibly, so yeah. That's one. That's one. Yeah, yeah. kind of response. If Unless you, you can have, you know, this sort of more integrated um, mm. understanding uh, mm. with the right brain. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So obviously, uh, you know, provisionality is a kind of um, it's a kind of complex name for a, a state which won't immediately get into that kind of anger when challenged. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so if you're um, believe something in a provisional way, then you have more nuanced ways of letting the right hemisphere information in without, uh, you know, when the, when the left hemisphere representation gets challenged, she doesn't immediately clam up and say, no, you're not having any of that alien mm. material in here. Thanks. Um, in terms of emotions, my understanding that it's the right hemisphere is more the centre for melancholy, for example. But what about depression? Because like, when you think about depression, it's like often when people say they're depressed, they feel stuck. They're in a closed system. Does that, that to me, in ways relates to the left hemisphere? Would you say depression is more a left hemisphere uh, symptom? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't claim in any way to be an expert on this, no. but but um, the sort of thing Ian McGilchrist says about this is certainly fits. Uh, you know, he talks about the relationship between um, quite a few. Um, what we regard as mental illnesses, which are quite frequent in modern society. So not just depression, but also anorexia and schizophrenia, for example. And, and he relates these to excessive left hemisphere dominance. And he also talks about um, the relationship between the kinds of things written by people with these conditions or, or produced by these people and some of the things produced by wider society. So, so conceptual art, for example, um, McGilchrist compares to the outputs of schizophrenics um, you know, that there is this this and he sees an excessive uh, left hemisphere dominance in both cases mm. um, so there's obviously some kind of there's a complex relationship there and I wouldn't try to sure. to give you a full de description of what depression is or for example in those terms and Ian McGilchrist might give you a much more nuanced one but mm. I think there is something in that yeah So, so how do you encourage this provisionality to uh, where did that begin? 
Uh, well, um, Viginalis, I think, is a, um, it's a central aspect of the middle way, really, that, that, um, so there's a wide range of practices that, that can contribute to that, you know, from yeah. meditation and, um, I see works with it directly in some ways. Um, the arts open up more symbolic possibilities so that we've got other, you know, we don't just shut things down because we don't find the meaningful alternatives now. Um, it's just another way of saying like integration then, is it? Yeah, it's, it's right. helping with integration. I yeah. Can remember if you'd used the word before or not. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and then, um, but also if we're thinking at the level of belief, then critical investigation becomes important to provisionality and so it's a openness to critical discussion or investigation of our beliefs. Uh, so in that way, beliefs which were previously in conflict with each other, you know, might find, might adapt themselves or be able to be adapted, uh, to something which is in harmony or which addresses, because it addresses the conditions better. So, so can people relate, um, the archetypes to experience is kind of a, a big question. I mean, what, what is your experience? That's just an example of... Well, I, no, it struck me because when I was out running this morning, when I go running, sometimes, you know, you, you start getting quite angry thoughts, you know, for, um, hmm. uh, and you try to be aware of them, you know, kind of and move on. But, uh, you know, I think of someone who did something awful to me a while back, and, you know, I'm trying to think, oh, you can forgive everything in loving kindness. But, the, but on this occasion, this one person, how could you ever forgive that? You know, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Now, for, and this person is a lovely person, a very nice person, but did something very, yeah. well, it seemed out of character, it surprised me, which I have refused to forgive, and I think that is you know, one thing which is unforgivable. Whereas, you know, when you now say it, I mean, it's so obvious that it's just me projecting something onto that person and really fixing it and black and white and... Uh, you know, you're never going to move on. You're never mm. going to, you know, mm. d integrate or whatever. But uh, I can see I have to. That is a way of dealing with it by saying, "Hang on, I'm doing this, not mm. you know, this person does not personify you know evil and mm. nastiness." Mm. Mm. Well, that Barry did an interesting interview with him. What is it, Maria Cantacuzino? Cantacuzino. Cantacuzino. Yeah. Yeah. Forgiveness. Yeah. Project. Oh yeah, and um, one person she talked about that I found very interesting was um, a woman called Jo Berry, and her her father was um, killed in the Brighton pub bombing, and um, when Patrick McGee was the who was the person who planted the bomb was let free about ten ten years after the event, she said at the time all she could feel was rage, and she yeah she basically saw him as evil. Um, but she also recognised that it was making her, it, she was not healing. Um, and um, especially when she came out, she felt um, she needed some, she needed to do something. So she went to Northern Ireland principally to try to understand, that's what she said, wanted to understand more. And she so found out more about the, the conditions concerning the conflict there. And then she started having some meetings with. Patrick McGee himself, and they eventually, well, she eventually came to the, a very uncomfortable conclusion that she couldn't be 100% sure that if she had been exposed to the conditions that he had been uh, in his life, that she wouldn't have done the same thing herself. Um, and and she said, that's not to say I still don't feel rage at times. She said, I I'm, you know, I think she says, very careful with forgiveness that often people forgive too early or too superficially. Uh, so she doesn't repress emotions of anger she feels or, or what, what sadness or whatever. But she's, um, she's found a way to actually get beyond that archetype with Patrick McGee and then they've become, they've become friends, which is it's really, really, I think, a very powerful, um, story, really. Just more of a bit more slightly amusing thing, but my personal experience with archetypes, I don't know if this affects you. I have no, I don't believe in the devil, but I mean, I'm, I'm terrible with scary films. If there's any, any sort of devil-like uh, character in a film, I'll go out, I'll go out the room and, and uh, but Katie will carry on watching it and I'll, I'll often look through the crack of the door and ask what's <laughs> happening. So, so it, these, so they're still very real for me in a meaningful sense. 
Hmm. What about you, Nama? Well, I was thinking about recent television experiences of people, and people have absolutely worshipped certain people, and then the letdown must be so important when these things are revealed about mm-hmm. them. I was just, uh, just came into my head about the um, outpourings uh, in relation to Robin Williams' death, mm-hmm. and um, because I've been around actors a lot in my life, you know, and I've had some of patients, friends or whatever, so I'm very aware how often the, the general public, to put them into a big <laughs> lump, often do somehow seem to confuse the actor and the roles. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, because Robin Williams sort of very well known, he's played a lot of roles that seem, you know, they're often the sort of guiding light and the, the, the hero of the the hour and whatever and so I wonder if to some extent the sort of some of the shock that people Mm. have displayed in who obviously don't personally know him um you know over over his suicide is is partly because that's blown this sort of archetypal myth because they're sort of Mm. archetypal sense of him is based on all their roles because they don't actually know him as a person they don't know how much he struggled with his depressions and anxieties and substance abuse and now his parkinson's which apparently was the thing that sort of sent him over the edge really and um so i think that's often been for me um something i've seen with um when someone's playing a role in public and you get the same with soaps you know you see people writing about soap characters as if they're real and some people you know treat them in real life as if they're real um i had another friend who who was in um east enders for a while and her partner used to say you know people would come up and talk to her as if she was this character and he'd you know and because she was at one time you know portraying something that people you know didn't like you know they they could be quite offensive and he's you know he was just wanting to <laughs> deck them kind of thing because they didn't seem to be able to cut off from the sense of yeah. that sort of p- portrayal mm. so I, it just makes makes me wonder you know if that's the case even with fictional situations where we know it's fictional how much harder it must be you know, with our own projections that are quite unconscious and, and not to us fictional, mm-hmm. what what a what a kind of difficulty that is to kind of challenge. Yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. I suppose that's the strength and the weakness of drama, isn't it? Because drama is a great opportunity to have these archetypes and to experience them and then you know, see them for what they are. Whereas something like a soap opera is particularly insidious because it goes on time after you know, day after day. So people then buy into the reality of it, don't they? As yeah. a continuity compared to a one off play or film. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It can make well, I'm thinking of myself. Make you a bit cynical. <laughs> um, you know, not, not not to be so trusting. Which is machine. So, so are you thinking of, of um, TV personalities like Jimmy Savile or whatever who've been found to be um, criminals or paedophiles or whatever? Well, I, I mean, I, I wasn't a fan of. Yes, but you know, that, I mean, that's an example. Mm. Mm. Thing isn't the whole point of celebrity that we build them up to knock them down anyway, isn't that a sort of standard British thing? That actually that's what we've done with like Wayne Rooney and whatever like just like you put them up on that like, still in order to be able to so actually like we want to project those archetypes in order to then take them away in order to then hit them hit them around the head mm-hmm. it begs the question and you made the point it's a typically British thing as opposed to say American culture which, which does so much less and wonder why that is might be balanced because you put them up Lock it up and you mm. lock them down. Lock them up. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, mm. 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 Price of one. But price of one. remember, the projection can have a negative side. So it's not just saying, "Well, this person is this archetype," but also that they're not. So, so denying the meaning that we found in that person as the archetype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're basically denying the archetype in some some cases. Um, so that can also create conflict. So that's that's a, obviously a good reason for. 
engaging with the archetype as an archetype in, in understanding that it is an archetype um, and that might be a way of avoiding that kind of reaction that, that when we realise that the hero has feet of clay or whatever that, that we don't actually then react against them and send them hate mail or whatever it is that, that people do but I, I doubt if it's just a British thing to do that it's probably a pretty universal <laughs> So do you feel it's possible to um, to work with archetypes or can you see ways that you might um, practice with your response to archetypes? Well, my response has always been if ever I've encountered someone sort of noticeably projecting onto me sort of qualities that I know are superior to what I actually <laughs> possess then I will deliberately do something or say something to try and smash that um, with varying degrees of severity depending on the situation but yeah because because I, I, I don't feel comfortable with knowing that somebody's got this sort of very false mm. expectation of me I guess and um, mm. uh so uh, yeah, I guess for my level of comfort, I, I will then try and readjust their <laughs> perception of me into a more sort of balanced and hopefully normal and more representative mm. notion of me. Is it as easy to do that if it's the other way around? If they paint you in a, a more um, derogatory light than a, than a positive light? No, I would struggle with that a lot more mm. because that would take a lot more because that's probably going to trigger issues within me that you know are still there you know to do with my own perceptions of myself mm. that might be negative and yeah. they're probably a bit more deeply entrenched and, yeah. and it takes and bring up a lot of more negative feelings so it takes longer to kind of work through that to then be able to feel empowered to say no it's, I'm not mm. I'm not that either yeah I think generalising theory here but I think probably that is the case for all of us it's easier to be self-effacing rather than no I'm actually better than you think I think I am but, but yeah that might be just as much part of the, the correction of or, mm. or attempt to challenge a projection yeah, yeah. I mean, people talk in psychological terms about projection. Do they sometimes mean you're projecting qualities that you have onto someone else or not? It could mean that you, yes but we so could just mean, sort of could be qualities that you have or qualities that you don't have, but that you would like to be projecting onto somebody else. Right. <laughs> if you build down people's pictures of you that, that they're building up in their head, then could that be the reason why one is single or whatever as well, though, or why one goes through being quite lonely? Mm. Like if you keep like just breaking down archetypes that people are projecting onto you or maybe that you're projecting onto other people as well not not ever thinking oh they're worthy of me or, mm. or maybe yeah. maybe that's a bit egotistic but still so are you suggesting that that a certain amount of projection is necessary to sort of form relationships with people I think it's like bound to happen you can like it's not even just necessary yeah. I think it's just like absolutely got to like that's just how it works you think oh I'm on your wavelength yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, in in that sense, it's a bit like what well, it is a cognitive bias thing that that yeah, cognitive biases often involve recognition of con kind of conditions in which we come to understand things and respond to things. Um, so the archetypes form part of that, and our tendency to project archetypes will, will form part of that. But again, I don't think that means that we can't work with them or um, limit the negative impact of projecting them. Um, so in the case of, you know, the, the sort of extreme of that of someone falling in love or saying, believing themselves to be in love with you or anybody else, then presumably if you try to sort of break them out of that sort of sense of seeing you as the one or whatever, um, then I can see that that, that may, if, if their belief is that they're looking for this single person that meets this ideal, then if you try and bust that myth, then perhaps they will move on and the relationship won't take off because they will think, oh, I was wrong, it isn't the one, you know, so they'll go and do it to somebody else who might yeah. allow them to sort of carry it on a bit further until, um, mm. yeah, so, yeah, I could see it could probably be a limiting factor about actually forming relationships. Mm. And that's obviously a, 
an issue for um, well any kind of spiritual group or any kind because um, if people are expecting certainties yeah, that's another way of saying they're projecting archetypes quite often so mm. if they're looking for the one true guru for example mm. as soon as they, they encounter the imperfect people they're going to encounter then uh, they may turn away and look for another group sure, which fulfills yeah, those yeah. expectations and, and that's obviously a, a fruitless quest <laughs> Unless the guru is happy to you know, play along with it and suggest that they do have all these qualities. In which case it may take a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs>